thank you very much for giving up your Tuesday evening. Um, and welcome back to those of you uh, for whom this is a regular appointment, trying to understand a little bit more about what private interventions for public benefit might look like, what it might mean, what problems it raises. Um, you've learned already over the last term or so that giving is hard. Um, it's not anything like as easy as it looks like when we all wish that we were rich enough to give away lots of money. What I hope you might hear tonight is that receiving is hard too and that the relationship between giver and receiver and the relationship between grant seeker and grant maker and grant user is a very complicated relationship that can be enormously fruitful and productive but which also often raises questions that are worth interrogating. Um, I want not only to welcome you back and to introduce our very distinguished guests tonight, but also to, to uh, say ahead of time how unusual this conversation is. It is very, very, very unusual for senior distinguished people who've spent a lifetime understanding the dynamics of giving and receiving, receiving and deploying, okay. receiving and using, to talk on the same panel about what that means. It's an old joke, it's a truism, that when you give money away, people think you're brilliant. Okay? But it's a rarely discussed question. What does that mean to be always right? So I'm enormously grateful to three very distinguished people whom I will introduce <coughs> briefly now. On my right is the person who's probably done more to influence my career choices and the direction of my life than any other single person. And I say that not because she's a grant giver, but because she's one of my oldest friends. Sally Orsberg runs the Skull Foundation. The Skull Foundation, for those of you who don't know, is one of the most thoughtful organizations committed to giving money in the world. On her right is Fiona Mafhinger, who was one of the first women to complete her education with the support of the organization founded by the person on her right. Today, Fiona is a lawyer and leads on the strategic development of the CAMFED Association, about which you will hear more in a minute. On her right, and you'll see how this got constructed, is, of course, Anne Cotton, who is the founder and president of CAMFED, which you will all know is an international non-profit organization which tackles poverty and inequality in sub-Saharan Africa by supporting girls to go to school and succeed in empowering them to become themselves leaders of change. Just to give you some sense of what that means in practice, more than three and a half million children have benefited from CAMFED's programs in a network of over 5,000 partner schools in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Ghana, uh, Tanzania, and Malawi. Um, I said I wasn't going to heap praise on your organization, but I'm just going to say, apart from all the honors that you have received, in a couple of years ago, CAMFED was recognized by the OECD um, for best practice in taking development innovation to scale. And a lot of you study development, and a lot of you talk about taking things to scale. We're very fortunate to have these three people here. The order of the evening is that I will ask each of them to speak to you briefly about their careers, their organizations, their choices. I will then try to ask questions on your behalf of those people. That process will take about half the evening, after which we will ask you to ask them questions which I will field. As is now standard in this context, start, I will ask you to start thinking now about your perfectly honed question. Whatever you do, frame your question as a question. 
when, you, when it comes to it, tell us who you are and tell us in particular if you wish your question to go to a particular person. If not, I will allocate it. Um, and if it's sufficiently brilliant as a question, all three people will answer it. That's the plan for the evening. We want at least half of it to be engaged with you and for you to ask us questions. So, to begin, if I may, I will ask Fiona if she would tell us a little bit about her life and uh, experience and how this looks from your perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, Stefan. My name is Fiona Mavinga. I am from Zimbabwe. And I grew up in rural Zimbabwe living with my grandmother. Why did I not stay with my parents? Because my parents believed in so much the power of education to transform lives. But where they were based, the nearest school was about 20 kilometers away. And they didn't think that my small body would be able to cope with the long distance to, to go to school. So therefore, they pegged me away to stay with my grandmother so that I can be able to go to school because school was um, about seven kilometers away from my grandmother's place and they, they thought that distance was a bit bearable. And so the struggle to attain education is very much personal to me. So many times I almost dropped out of school because we didn't have the means to keep me in school all the time. I used to work almost every weekend to be able to raise money for very small minor things like the stationery, the books and pens, to be able to go to school and for the uniform as well so that you would look decent among other children. And I occupy a unique position now because I am sort of like I have transitioned from being a receiver of aid and help for me to be able to complete my education. Comfort supported me through university and I went to on to become a lawyer in Zimbabwe. I qualified and graduated in 2002 and my life has completely transformed from perhaps the life of many other girls that I grew up with in my village and I am sort of like a beacon of the power of education to transform, to transform lives. And at the moment, we have been able to come together, all the young women who were supported through school by Comfort and form an alumni network, which we called the Comfort Association, or in short, Kama. Kama started in 1998 with only about 400 young women. Comfort had started um, about five years earlier with Anne visiting Zimbabwe to investigate and find out why most <laughs> girls were not in school. And <coughs> not speaking on her behalf in terms of her findings, I think what struck her most was that the sole purpose of why girls were not in school was because of poverty, because parents were not able to meet the school going course and not necessarily that there was a culture of not keeping girls in school, but actually it was <coughs> poverty was the most deterrent factor. And then she came back to the UK to be able to fundraise and started by supporting only the first group of 32 girls and with more investment and support from well wishers, she was able to ensure that the organization keeps growing and growing and able to support more girls. So in 1998, the first 400 graduates came together to be able to talk about what next. And we, it dawned on us on the second day of our meeting that actually being together is much more powerful. It addresses our isolation. It addresses our fears of the next steps after completing our GSCs because we didn't have, we're coming from very poor backgrounds with no networks, with no access to information. But being together gave us a platform through which we can be able to access and share that information to give hope to each other. And it then transcended to become a sisterhood movement. So now the Kama Network has over 100,000 young women across five countries, and I have the privilege of heading and supporting the development of our alumni network and being in a position to also negotiate 
and to broker the power dynamics between our funders who support Kamawek and also with the organization that works, provides a platform for us to be able to be together, which is comfort. So in brief, that's me. <laughs> Perfect introduction. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And um, well, Fiona, it's been a, such a privilege to, uh, to know you and to work alongside you um, for, for many, many years. And just picking up on your point around the beginnings of Camford, it, it is indeed the case that what I, when I first went to Zimbabwe, I went to the West, um, in the Nyami Nyami, where the Tonga people had been shifted when the Kaliba Dam was built in 1956, for, forcibly. Uh, resettled by what was then the Southern Rhodesian government, uh, of course, operating under the in the, in the, in the colonial system. And uh, it was the poorest part of the country, which was why I went there, which was to look at the imbalance in enrollment between boys and girls. It was very, very extreme there. In spite of the heavy investments Zimbabwe had made uh, to multiply access to education, there were seven boys for every, every girl at, at secondary school. And all that I had read um, going uh, before going told me that to expect that the problem was culture, the resistance of people to the education of girls. And what I felt and saw completely uh, undermined that. And uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said, when, when a lot of people agree with each other, then you've probably got a problem and you need to look at it hard. And the received wisdom indeed was that the culture was the problem. It was the poverty of people's culture. And I uh, heard consistently from chiefs, from children, from parents, from teachers, that there was no opportunity to send girls to school alongside boys because the, the wider context, if you like, favoured favored boys who had a much better chance of paid work. And in the absence of any other security, in the absence of you know, any other safety net, um, this, this was critical to the ongoing survival of the family. So, th so that was really the beginning, and it was the, the injustice of girls' exclusion from education, but also the injustice of the blame uh, being placed squarely on people who were absolutely not in a position to, uh, to send their daughters to school alongside boys for very obvious reasons. That, uh, they had a rationale, and that rationale was sound in the circumstances. Uh, so I began to really, uh, if you like, um, challenge the injustice of, of that perception by acting because I was told I was wrong. I was told in the, in the sometimes, you know, in fairly um, dismissive, parent, uh, patronizing terms that I was absolutely wrong and people told me what they thought I wanted. I, I wanted to hear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought the only way to do this is to demonstrate, to, to offer opportunities. So that was the, the birth of Camford. Thank you. Um, Sally. Uh, I'm Sally Osberg. I have the great privilege of being the president and CEO of the Skoll Foundation, but I want to start with a um, confession. Um, these two people on either end are... Um, are very dear friends, and it's going to be very hard for me to um, uh, to challenge them, but I'm going to try. And Fiona is going to keep us all honest up here, so we're counting on her for that. Um, I have the privilege of leading Jeff Skoll's foundation. Jeff Skoll, some of you know, was the uh, founding president of eBay, and upon eBay's um, uh, public offering, he decided to put his wealth to work around a vision he'd held for, since he was a kid. And that vision was to uh, use his fortune really to solve the world's most pressing problems. He created the Skoll Foundation with that mandate to go after the big problems in the world, the problems that affect vast swaths of humanity and that could, could if, if resolved or if headway were made, actually improve the global condition. Um, what he didn't have was a strategy. Um, what he didn't have were sort of programmatic buckets. So I was employee number one, the first person to come on board. That's a Silicon Valley term. We say employee number one. Jeff was employee number one at eBay. Stefan is employee number one at the Marshall Institute. Um, I'm employee number one at, at, uh, at the Skull Foundation. Anne was 
Well, you were the founder <laughs> and employee number one at, the, uh, at, at, at Camp Fed. So um, I got to work and I saw really my challenge um, as really ensuring that Jeff's DNA, who he was, what he cared about, the way he thinks, and what he wanted to achieve in the world were actually uh, built into the foundation's DNA. So long after I was gone, it would continue to do work in the way uh, that he wanted it to. Uh, what I discovered early on was that Jeff was every bit an entrepreneur, and he was attracted to people who didn't just have ideas about how to make something better or improve it around the margins or, or keep, I see Rupert Howes back there, keep, um, keep throwing fish at people who were hungry, but, um, but really to get at the root causes and to, um, to empower people. So as we're talking about philanthropy here, we're gonna be talking about power. And one of the principles of the Skoll Foundation is you use that power to unlock power. You unlock power in those for whom the stakes are highest. And those are the people who are most oppressed or marginalized by whatever, whatever um, issue is at work in their, in their lives and in their communities. So my job was to really challenge his, uh, channel his DNA into the ethos of the, of the foundation and to develop some programmatic um, buckets, as it were. Uh, Jeff was a, a person who was really uh, highly motivated as a young man by what he read, and so storytelling was very important. We built that into the foundation's uh, work and into its ethos. Uh, pressing problems were not, um, were not all alike. Uh, some folks say we're issue agnostic. We are not issue agnostic. We look for problems where the stakes are large and where there are vast swaths of people who are affected by them and where if there is, is an intervention that can make an order of magnitude difference, we go after that. So we didn't have the term at the time, social entrepreneur, but we figured it out and that's what we ended up doing. We invest in, connect, and celebrate social entrepreneurs and the innovators who help them solve the world's most pressing problems. Um, we've been at it since 2001. Jeff created the foundation in 1999 on what he calls an installment plan. He moved 10 million in and then he kept moving money in until today we have a, a very significant endowment. But if you ever hear people talking about the X billion million, whatever it is, um, organization or foundation run the other way. Because if you defined yourself by the amount of money you have at your disposal, you are probably not the kind of person I want to talk with or work with or um, partner with. So money is not, the, is not the sine qua non of philanthropy. The sine qua non is partners like the women you see here and the gentleman to my left. That's what unlocks power and that's what makes philanthropy credible and uh, legitimate. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to disagree at some point this evening, but, I, but, but not yet. Um, we talk a lot here about co-creation. We talk a lot here about um, having learned from mistakes that involve the imposition of solutions. You will all be familiar with terms like nothing about me without me. How do you, how do you actually achieve that when in your case, you're building a strategy that is looking at least in one way towards Jeff and in another way towards the world. In your case, you're building a strategy that, um, uh, that is one step closer, but still at a, at a remove. And in your case, where you're speaking, even you speaking for people who aren't you, it's a, it's a, it's a confounding question and I wonder I wonder whether it's one of those that goes to the heart of this power question. I'm going to start with you. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile being smart in Palo Alto and the, the ultimate destination or, or impact of every dollar you allocate? Well, um, there's a real tension at work in the way we approach um, uh, us identifying social entrepreneurs and working with them. And that tension I describe as between ambition on the one end 
And uh, let me be very frank, we are ambitious. That's why we take a lot of, um, we devote a lot of energy to identify the people whom we believe will drive change. Not who will just, you know, work around the margins or say good enough, but people who are going to be fierce and relentless and driving change. But at the other end of the spectrum is humility. And so balancing that tension between ambition and humility is a way of working. We understand uh, the importance of context. We understand proximity, that we don't have the answers, but the people in communities do have the answers. It's often been, it's often been uh, oppressed out of them. <laughs> so don't ever believe it when you say, uh, when you hear, um, be close, you have to get close to the problem. Well, often, you're the reason that problem exists in the first place. What you have to get close to are the people, the context, the situation, and the forces that have created the problem in the first place so that you can empower the people uh, who are the greatest stakeholders in its solution. So that ambition and um, humility, I think, are, are core to the, way, to the way we work and the way we believe most social entrepreneurs work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I can follow up to that, I think you said something very, very powerful in your introduction to say you unlock the power. And with, within that, for me, I see there's an inherent recognition that there is power that resides in whatever areas of intervention that we want to work in. And in our case, in terms of girls' education, it's um, recognition that there is um, there might be lack of financial capital to be able to support the school going cost of girls to go to school, but there is rich social capital, knowledge capital that resides within those poor communities that can be harnessed and can be used to be able to ensure that actually girls are, get to go, be in school, remain in school, do well when they are in school and that when they graduate they will also be able to become you know agents of change within that and this is something that i think comfort has been able to do very well in the communities that comfort has been working with in terms of realizing to say that you cannot just come in and say i have money i'm going to send your girls to go to, go to school that's not enough it's who are the duty bearers that have responsibility over children within this community is the traditional leaders, the parents, the school. How do we bring these people together to be able to formulate the solutions that will keep girls in school and ensure that they do well? So that particular inherent recognition of power and just perhaps using resources to unlock it, providing the tools to unlock that power and ensure that you build sustainability is very important. Well, the ambition, you know, and uh, it fundamentally, and let me just say, Sally, in terms of Skoll Foundation, um, that you are ambitious for those you, you want to elevate in the network. And you have a very challenging um, process, which actually does raise ambition of itself. I, I can remember going through that process very well and remembering that sense of, the possible as a result of that engagement, the possible beyond what we already felt we were being ambitious, but you, ra you, know, you raised our sights. And that, that is a quality that is, is very unusual. Um, and I think that is, that is what we do in our work, that we want to raise the sights of the young rural girl, beyond, well beyond um, you know, her, her immediate environment, well beyond what she has expected to do in her life, while at the same time honouring her background. So it is not about taking, as you say, Fiona, taking children, taking away and saying there's an opportunity here, mm -hmm. but it's saying we work with you, we work with the, the entire community to enable those who are the most disadvantaged to, to, move, to move forward. So you move forward with the support of your community and that, the, the quality of the relationship, the quality of the relationship you build, the quality of the confidence you build in the community is actually a benchmark for them in terms of how they can now negotiate with the health service, with the education service, with other NGO partners. Because 
what they're used to is disrespect. Yeah. They are used to sitting in line at the, at the clinic and for five hours and being told, well, it's closing now, come back tomorrow, and walking you know, five miles there and back. That, that, is, that is the experience that they are used to in relation to authority. So actually thinking very, very hard about the message you convey, about the power dynamic between you know, all of us in, in that whole chain is actually going to be fundamental in terms of, of the ambition and the confidence as a, as a direct outcome of, the, of, the, of, of what you're doing. So it goes well beyond, okay, we've got X number of girls in school, uh, X number of, of doctors. It's, it's actually the inner change mm -hmm. in terms of what you perceive about yourself and what you perceive about your family, your community, and the respect that you convey back. Let, let me ask a question that moves a little bit beyond Skull and Camphead and Camera. There is a critique in, in modern philanthropic circles amongst people who think hard about this stuff that essentially we've locked ourselves into a, into a dance in which grant seekers spend a lot of energy that they might be spending otherwise figuring out how to make grant makers happy. Okay, and this is not just in the form in which they apply for the money, it's in the proposals they make about impact and measurement and so on. Grant makers spend a lot of time, as it were, putting pressure on grant seekers to conform to some standards of measurement impact. And that this dance has become a rather insular dance, which has somehow lost touch with the objects that were originally part of the grant maker and the grant seeker's mission. I, I think, uh, have I expressed clearly what, that, what I mean by that debate? Y you are all, as it were, actors in that debate. You're all voices in that debate. And I wonder if we could hear your views, because I think it's quite a, a serious critique. May I start with you as a foundation head? <laughs> well, it is a serious critique. Um, and. Um, uh, I'd first start with uh, with the diligence. Anne spoke about the process of our of our diligence at the foundation, and we we go into uh, communities in order to see um, and meet and um, and uh, consult with um, folks like Fiona. And I'm not going to use the the B for beneficiary word because I think it is so demeaning <laughs> to think that you know, the, the folks who are, uh, as I said, the, the whole secret to whether anything changes in a community, in an issue, in a life, um, are spoken of in that, in that way. Um, but that, that process of understanding how the work unfurls, uh, what the values are, how the, um, how the uh, organization comports itself, whether there's a level of trust, whether there is authenticity in the relationships, whether there is um, integrity in what you're able to see on the ground um, as a result of the work. I remember, um, I remember visiting uh, in, in Zambia um, with Anne. It was anything but a dog and pony show. It was exhausting um, and brilliant. Um, uh, but I remember learning from a young woman that the standard development practice was to support a girl child um, year on year, you know, one year at a time. So as that child grew, um, she could be dropped like a stone. She might have been, had the support to go to school one year and not have it the next. You'd be a year older, she'd be far more vulnerable. Um, to child marriage, to exploitation, to everything else. Well, we go into the field to learn. We go into the field to um, learn from people like Fiona and the communities. That's what actually establishes the baseline for an authentic relationship with, um, with our partners. And uh, Stefan is right, there's a grantor, there's a grantee. The grantee is an intermediary. The, um, the folks on the ground are the real um, authenticators of any, uh, anything 
we do and for its, its value. I like to say that social entrepreneurship is not just about value creation, societal value creation, or reinforcement, or empowerment. It's about a way of working. That way of working is a social way of working in partnership, in solidarity um, with others. And that's, that's the way we try to address this power asymmetry. Do you, are you conscious of the dance? Uh, there is a dance. Um, and uh, there are many dances, actually. And, it's, and there are many steps in the dance. And you have to decide what steps uh, you're going to dance to. Um, and I think as, you know, talking of your, 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 your visit, Sally, it was not choreographed. You know, I think so much uh, in, in terms of the relationship between the grant makers and the, the, the recipients, uh, there's a choreography and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's managed to an infinite degree. Uh, and in a way, what you heard from that child, you know, I, in a way I, I couldn't have, I wouldn't have told you that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have told you that this, the context of girls' education is one in which, you know, children are, are dropped because we are constantly being asked, you know, by, by schools to, 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 to help them through. But, but it happened, and it happened because it wasn't choreographed. Mm -hmm. And so when you haven't got the choreography, you, you can establish a much stronger basis of trust. But I, I remember, you know, what, 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 what is the dance? I was standing in a, in a line with a, a chancellor of a university in the US, and we were called by a donor to a rehearsal the, pre, the day before we were to sit on the stage. And we had to process up onto the stage, and he turned to me and he said, is it like this in royal weddings? And I said, oh, I, I have no idea. I've never been to a royal wedding. And he said, well, you know, I haven't had to do this and since I was in school. And there we were, you know, could we walk up onto the stage, you know, in the right order and, you know, smile. And it, 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 was, it was absurd. And we both felt, you know, are we being demeaned by this? No, not really, because we're prepared to do it for our institutions, for our organisations, because of the, the, the higher purpose of this, if you like. But don't ask a child, you know, don't ask a rural child who, who doesn't understand that power dynamic to dance for you, mm -hmm. to sing for you, mm -hmm. to write you letters of great of gratitude um, and then publish them. Because what you actually want is for that child to feel a sense of entitlement. I am entitled to go to school. And so it, it, if you like that sense, the dance is going on at, at every level. Um, and the crucial thing is, is, is if you know, as, a, as, as the res organ recipient organization, if you need to pepper your reports, putting the name of the donor every other sentence, so be it. If that's what they want, fine, because it's going to get you know, 10,000 children support. But if they ask you, right, we would like you to tell us the HIV and AIDS status of the girls in your program, I'm sorry, you know, goodbye, <laughs> unless you can negotiate out of that, because you have to think first and foremost of the person you serve, of the child you serve, of the community you serve. And unless you have that at the forefront of your mind, you are actually disempowering yourself, because you will, you will do this, yeah. you know, and you will dance, and that dance will be incoherent. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, there's undoubtedly, it's undoubtedly going on, but you have to figure it out. For me, it's, it's you get what you, what you give. And you can only give what is in your core principles. The core values that perhaps as an organization you hold dearly onto and say that this is non-negotiable. And I know that uh, one of the fundamental principle of comfort is protection of the girl child and the girl child at the forefront. And whatever is in the best interest of the girl child is what the organization will be able to do. So the role for comfort there is to then align the values, to find value alignment between the funder and the community that is going to be served and be able to broker that relationship on behalf of the constituency that they, they serve. And once the organization, constituents that is being served actually knows that comfort is this core principle and they will abide by it no matter how much money is being dangled. 
they know that they, they feel safe and protected and they're not going to be artificial with the organization. They're actually going to do very much deeper engagement so that whatever intervention is being given is sustainable. Otherwise, you get artificial engagement because you are giving something that is, you know, on the surface. But if you are prepared and say, we will not, you build that trust that I was talking about. And trust is a very much valuable currency within our communities. Particularly, and if I think about is the long term support. So you don't just come in and give aid, give food packets today and next month you've disappeared. But if you've worked with an organization for a long time, Comfort has worked with communities in Zimbabwe for 25 years now and has actually been able to cre ensure that those districts that started on the Comfort program are the ones that go and launch the program in a new district and mentor their fellow compatriots in education and health and also even us as Kama members when we launched Kama we were at the forefront of supporting the expansion of Kama in Ghana in 2000 when the first young women had graduated so it was us Kama members that were going and saying that this is what we have done after receiving comfort support we believe that when we come together we'll be able to achieve more and we did that with the network in Zambia, in Tanzania, and recently in Malawi when we launched with only 212 girls and now it's grown to over 13,000. So, and because of that long-term investment and the trust it builds, communities become, you know, much more deeper, deeply engaged and committed to the change and are able to celebrate with the organization on the successes. So, what is it that you are giving? What are in your core principles? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try again, okay, for a slightly different tack on, on, on broadly the same question. I understand absolutely that the position that each of you has just outlined, we might define as the kind of positive benchmark for uh, relationships that honor all the participants in it. Relationships based on trust and, and um, uh, understanding and sympathy and that, the, the, as it were, try as hard as possible to minimize or eradicate asymmetries of power. Mm -hmm. But it, but, and so, and now move it away from that, which I take to be, as it were, what we take to be the way we should aspire to behave. We all know recipients of funding who wish they didn't have to take that funding. So what is it, as it were, institutionally or structurally, that is going wrong in the system if, if you, what you three have outlined is the positive benchmark. You know, if you're the best, if your best practice and lots of practice doesn't meet that standard, is that a fact about the world? Is it something we should act to change? Is it, um, is it something that we should, as it were, cough politely and pretend doesn't exist? What's, well, where, do, where do we sit on those systems that, that don't live up to the standards of Skoll and Camford? Because I'm sure there are lots. Of course there are, Stefan. Um, uh, and there are within um, another dance is the um, competition among NGO providers. I mean, Anne and Fiona can talk about dozens and dozens of organizations that purport to um, uh, support young women and who do it in ways that are less credible than the way do it they do it but you know the let's just start with the premise this is an unequal unequal world and wealth is more and more concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people and those people have um, you know they have uh, uh, the sense that they are living in a world that's unsustainable and philanthropy is something of an of an outlet for them. Not all of them are doing what they could do or as well as they could, and not all of them are strengthening the government institutions that are the ultimate arbiters of, of, um, of rights and justice. But we live in an increasingly unequal world, and I actually think philanthropy is um, unprepared. To be, uh, to be as effective as we need as a global society right now, unprepared. 
and ill-prepared. I couldn't agree more, which is one of the reasons I think these are very important debates, because if philanthropy is, as it were, undermined from within, that, that challenge won't be met. Mm -hmm. My last question, which is really more for you two, uh, and, and it's highly personal. How do you discount people wanting things and you therefore being the cleverest person in the room or the best looking person in the room or how in your private in your in your public relationships do you deal with that complicated fact that when people meet the head of Canfed or the head of the Skull Foundation they find it I, I imagine almost impossible not to frame that relationship in terms of beneficiary, donor, money, need, whatever, whatever the binary is that you care about. I, I don't mind which of you start. It's a very hard question. But I, but I wondered, because you must have reflected on this privately. Sally. You're asking me. I, I thought I was you. off the hook. I thought you were going to ask. <laughs> I am um, ask uh, Well, um, if you believe everything people tell you, you probably don't have much power of um, uh, judgment. So um, you first of all have to discount the flattery and discount the, um, the obsequiousness and um, strive for a relationship that's predicated on trust and mutual, mutual respect. And the, f you know, the wonderful thing about social entrepreneurs is that they, they tell us what they think. You know, I can tell you a story about Ann Cotton um, and a film crew we sent into the <laughs> field um, to document Camp Fed's work and the experience of, of girls. And uh, she called in a rage. She called in a rage about this filmmaker who was more interested in the shot than in, the, in respecting the girls. Well, we were you know, we were thrown back on our heels. We had to call the filmmaker and tell him to get out of there or to start behaving himself. She let us know, you know, it, it was out of line. We were out of line. This was unacceptable. You know, that's the culture we've tried to cultivate at the, at the Skoll Foundation, a culture of critique, a culture of um, mutual respect, and a culture of honesty. And I'm sure, I'm sure, we still only hear about 10% of what people, uh, you know, what people think when they um, are either frustrated, discouraged, or don't know why we're not giving them uh, as much money as they would like. For people from the UK of a particular vintage, it, th this is what's called the Mrs. Merton question. Um, just before I ask Anne to answer the same question, start getting ready to put your hands up and a microphone will come to you, because I'm going to come to the floor in a second. <laughs> complicated, <laughs> Mrs. Merton question. Well, Sally, do you remember telling me off once at a philanthropic forum? Probably. <laughs> do you? No, <laughs> I don't. But I remember it. No, I, I, getting a telling off from someone you respect is, is, is a very important moment. But I was travelling with a camera member, and uh, we were talking to... Uh, uh, you weren't in that conversation, Sally, but I, I was talking with a, 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 a woman who was there as a, as a donor. And um, uh, the camera member was speaking, and the, this lady turned and said, What's she saying? I don't understand her accent and I was really a bit affronted by, Livid. by that Livid. Um, but I was you know I was I was courteous uh, to the lady but uh, then I apologized um, uh, and I, I I was telling Sally later and I was how appalled I was and she stopped me and she said but you're a bridge <laughs> you are a bridge do you understand that and I always remember that you know we we are bridges and we never have to 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 not create that that bridge for for people to walk you know towards us towards towards the problem towards a deeper understanding because at the end of the day donors are people you know sometimes i remember in the early days of camford have a very very bright member of staff and they write to a donor as if who is this person? You know what? What you know? What is this? This is a human being at the other end who's going to read this and is, you know engage them. And so it's always remembering that it's our pe people, our people, and they all have experiences, however elevated, however powerful. They have 
experiences in their lives that have been moments of vulnerability. And you can use that as a bridge to understanding. You just have to find, you know, those, those opportunities. And I think as a social entrepreneur, you know, from a standing start, you know, Rupert, you know, we, we have to have that, that emotional intelligence to, to move forward with people, whether it's a government minister, a civil servant, a grandmother, um, you know, and, and, and that dynamic, you have to read those dynamics because where they become, I think, most problematic is when you are with someone who really does see you as the answer frankly to prayers you know prayers in the family and you have to you have to alter the dynamic in that relationship to to help that person to understand that you you are you are the grandmother you are the mother of the father of the child i am i am, i am not taking responsibility here i am going to enable something that should be happening you know and and so you have to really close that gap and find find common cause and, and so always using your own experience, using your own experience of life. And for me, I was a scholarship girl from the 11 plus. I had seven years of misery being the poor relation in a, in a, in a, a very expensive uh, school for girls in Wales. Uh, my father didn't have a car, I'd never been on a horse, I didn't understand why people liked cleaning out stables at the weekends, we had never been abroad, I hadn't even been to London, somebody in my class had her hair cut in Vidal Sassoon. This was a world I didn't know and I shrank into myself. I did not perform well academically and I understood, you know, when, when really Camford was born and we created this programme that that was a very rich and important experience that I could draw upon. So it, it's, it's always about people. And um, whether you're a donor, whether you're a child, you know, finding, finding building a community of, of people that you connect with. Brilliant answer. Okay, questions. First hand I saw going up awkwardly for the microphones is right in the middle there. Um, and then I'll come over this side in a minute. I've got three or four or five or six questions. Try and frame it as a question. I'll try my best. Um, I'm Constantha. I'm a student of Masters of Public Administration in the Social Impact Stream. And this question is for Anne and Fiona, I guess. Con starting from the premise that education should be a universal, right? If we start from that premise. To what extent do you think that your efforts might be undermining the government capacity to provide that education if they know that at the end of the day you're going to fund it? So why should they direct resources there? So I, I, I would like to answer that. And uh, I would say that there is recognition and in most of um, the countries that we work with, uh, right to education is actually in the Bill of Rights as uh, guaranteed by the Ministries of Education. But recognizing that the government does not, might, might not provide the resources to be able to come behind providing that right. And generations of particularly of children and, and the people that will bear the brunt of the lack of resources to be able to provide that right are poor people and those generations cannot afford to be able to wait. So it is important that whoever is be able to mobilize resources to be able to support governments. So one thing that is very important in terms of how comfort works is the entry point is not necessarily going to a community and say we're going to support girls, is to negotiate with the national governments and find out where are the areas the way girls are, or children are not in school and what are the reasons? What is it that comfort can be able to come behind government to be able to provide that right? So it's not necessarily going with um, being confrontational and saying you are not go providing that right. It's like, how can we help you as a government to be able to support marginalized children so that no one is um, left behind and we can respond urgently, particularly to this generation that is at the risk of missing out of school and then the government will then identify and say we will work with this and these districts according to the demographics or the data that they have about girls not being in school 
and once they have identified you then work with government officials that are within that particular district to say, who are responsible for ensuring girls education so is the ministry the district education office for example the police the social welfare offices and bring those people on the table and say what is it that you are doing to ensure that you provide this right to the children they'll then say oh we have these challenges but what is it that you can do and then we can work with communities we can do this what if comfort brings in the financial resources to be able to support you to take your children to school what is it that you will do so there is that recognition and responding urgently to this generation so that they can have uh, we are not doing them a favor you are providing them with access to the right that they have okay i can't remember who's next i think you're next um hi my name is valentina i'm a phd candidate at the lse uh, my question is probably for sally um, and it's about the dance that you were referring to so we do you, you spoke about vision and donor vision and you talk about people and the fact that it's important to follow what people need i wonder whether we we do know that there are many players, so you have many visions and you have many, um, many wants from different people. I wonder whether we should follow the visions, we should follow the wants, or if there is a way to coordinate all those visions and to put back people in the center of the discussion. Yeah, I'm trying to understand the question. Um, let, let me see so if I can. Re yes. Let me see if I've understood Please. the uh -huh. question. You talked about the donor vision. Right. You talked about the need in the world. Right. And I think the question is: Are those two things? Can you honour both in the same act? Is that the question? Is that the question? Yeah. And if you can, yes. If you can. Okay, good. If that's the question, that's the question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, uh, and, um, and yet I will be, um, I'll be uh, very honest and say that there is, that, that, that Jeff as the donor is chairman of our board. I, as the CEO, am accountable to him and to that board. That's our governance structure. And I can tell you that when my team goes into the field, when I go into the field, when we learn as much as we do, it's not always easy to translate that knowledge so that the board understands at the same level that we do what's at stake and what, why our recommendation is what it is. So that's, that's kind of the practical, that's the, those are the mechanics of the way this works. But it's you know, no different from a company with a corporate structure that can lose sight of its customers. And so with everything we do, and this is why we do a lot of work with filmmaking and storytelling, we try to make this work and this cultural expression of the social entrepreneur in community come alive for people. Because Anne talked about emotional intelligence. Well, it can be a very dry business to put together a grant recommendation memo with the impact thesis and the financials and the due diligence all represented as if it were an investment recommendation memo, which it is. But unless you make that work come to life, um, people aren't going to feel it. And they've got to feel it as well as understand it. And so that's the work we try to do so that ultimately Jeff and the board understand. Another thing we've done, and this goes to our connect imperative, is we've created, as Stefan knows well, as, as Anne knows well, this, this forum that we carry on every year in Oxford. And that brings together our community of social entrepreneurs. So our board and many other people of means get to interact with these change makers. And the distinctive, um, one of the distinctive characteristics of the Skoll Forum is that those change makers and their constituents are at the heart. They're not on the margins as they are in other philanthropic gathering where the power players are here and, and there's like a, there's like a, a gallery along, alongside and no pitching, no pitching now, you can't, you know, you can't pitch. Um, 
uh, we put those players right at the center, and that's another way we try to balance the vision and the interests of the constituents. Uh, I'm an SEL student. Um, my master is in social development practice. And uh, I agree when you say money is not the sine qua non. Uh, but I would say outputs are not the sine qua non as well. So I wonder uh, how do you uh, measure the outcomes? What are the key ele elements for that? And if you ever had any disagreement between your perspectives in this matter? Thank you. Outcome measurement and particularly whether there's a consensus between you, in this case, really you, um, on what those might or could be. Mm. Well, th this is a, you know, something that in an organization we're, l we're looking at continuously because um, you know, in, in the case of our organization, of course, it's evolved. Um, and the, um, it's evolved from supporting primarily girls' education to one in which there's now a movement, a movement for change that is led by uh, those who have gone through the program. And that is the most powerful constituency, um, the, the most powerful constituency now. And so the, um, th so we have to constantly, and, and I, have, I am no longer the, the CEO of Campford, uh, Lucy Lake, who's been my colleague, uh, for, for was my colleague since the very, very early days, is now the CEO of Camford, and, and uh, I am, obviously I founded it. But Lucy uh, is, is now co occupies that position, and this is a, an absolute priority for her and the whole team of making sure that we continue to, uh, you know, be at the leading edge in terms of our impact assessment, and that we inform the sector, we inform the donors about, about impact. We, because what you measure is, is also a measure of who you are, because it, it actually shows what your priorities are. You know, so, so you, can, you absolutely can read between the lines um, of an organization's measurement system. Um, we, for example, you know, we, are, we are very precise in our numbers. And we are precise because that's part of our philosophy that, that every child is an individual. So we will not say, oh, you know, in our report, oh, 100,000 here or, you know, a million there. There is a precision. And part of the, uh, the Camford's ethos is that if there is, you know, you, you can say, a, a donor could come in and say, right, I want to see the uh, particular individual in, and you could choose randomly, a child in Form 4, in this school, in this district, in Malawi. And we could go into the system and we could show that individual how long that girl has been, you know, supported by CAMFED, what stage she's at, what her academic record is, any particular problems. And there are layers, of course, uh, of privacy. But all of that is, is there available. And it is linked into the finance system so you can see what payments have been made on behalf of that child. So, you know, uniform in form one, in form three. So there, the, the, the quality of, of the measurement of, of, of what you're doing is, is one element and how you do it demonstrates your philosophy and your ethos. But then the much wider impact is, you know, how do you measure the leadership of CAMA? Uh, and that is a very big question, um, and 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 you know that is a continually evolving question, and the, the, because the the institution is continuing to evolve, and we need to keep pace with that evolution, and CAMA's own institutional uh, development of thinking about itself and how it's evolving. So you know it's it's a it's a complex ongoing um, undertaking within any uh, organization worth its salt really that that needs to be um, examined very carefully and, and I don't think donors should be shy in in asking for and in demanding information um, I always remember when we, when we were with working with the Financial Times and they asked me the question because we had the first two years of that of that opportunity and they asked me the question what do you think we should be asking when we do the due diligence for the next organization? And I said, ask very precisely. 
you know, if it's an organization that's supporting um, education or health, ask, give us, you know, give us the information. And can we see that information in your system? Uh, you know, are, are, are figures inflated? So, so, so I think that donors can be very reasonable um, in, in asking and not being afraid to ask because sometimes it said, oh, this is too demanding. This is too, well, actually, we're, we're answerable, aren't we, to, to the client, to the people we serve. And so we are answerable in terms of having the information. It's a bit of a convoluted answer. I think um, I haven't been as coherent as I might have been in that response. I've given a series, but I you know that... You said um, something very important, though, and it's a criterion for us when we look at um, those social entrepreneurs whom we opt to fund, um, that they have, that they have a system of feedback. You know, people talk about NGOs as, as missing the feedback mechanisms of markets, well, in fact, that's what we look for. Where is your feedback loop? What are you gathering data on? How do you use that data? Is it verifiable? Um, does, it, does it matter? We want to see that you have that system. That's the way we're assessing how serious you are about driving change. Mm -hmm. So CAMFED, I know, because I've seen it in the field, that, they, that every child whom they support is, is verified mm -hmm. and they also, they also are affecting policies, the child protection policy in Tanzania, in I think, and in, in Zambia, first child protection policy. So we're looking at their, they're looking at their system of um, evaluating and I agree with you completely that it's not about outputs. Mm -hmm. And if I may probably also add, it's also about what, um, why are you valuing, for example, that data is it donor driven for example or is actually something that is going to be more useful so one of the key things that i find um, very very important is that you don't extract data mm -hmm. from the communities mm -hmm. and expect to use it for external purposes when you empower the communities with their data for example if there is we are measuring is there is their data mm -hmm. if they have uh, had um, so w I was at a um, comfort stakeholders annual general meeting in Malawi in November last year. And one thing that um, struck me when the districts were reporting in terms of their performance, in terms of uh, girls that have dropped out of school, and they were very precise to the number. And they were saying that 642 girls had dropped out of school in that particular year, and one CDC member who is member or is responsible for implementing comfort stood up and said, do you recognize that this is equivalent to two schools being closed down? Because on average, a school might have 320 children in a school. So can you realize the, you know, this, what this represents, the magnitude of it, and what is it that we, as duty bearers in this community, we can be able to do to ensure that we do not close two schools every year. So it's about giving back that particular information. So it's not just donor driven, but it's also to be able to empower communities to do and develop solutions for the challenges they are facing. Hi, my name is Sung Hae Park and I'm an LSE alumni and I'm a lawyer specializing in social finance. Um, so, uh, same profession as, as um, Fiona. Uh, my question is mainly aimed towards Anne and Fiona. And we talk about power dynamics as if there are one set of power dynamics across the board. But what I'm particularly interested in your experiences of different kinds of power dynamics challenges that you encounter, depending on the type of donor or social investor. So I can imagine that government grants and then you know social investors and impact investors and family offices, philanthropic foundations are all different. But I can imagine that they might come with their own specific types of challenges and types of power dynamics. I'd be really great to hear your experiences in some of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, indeed, they are all different. But, and I don't think you can divide them up you know, segment, uh, I think there, it, it, perhaps in terms of government, um, uh, that, that is a, you know, a particular approach. But, but uh, government aside, um, all the other donors, uh, one couldn't say, okay, family foundations, uh, corporate foundations, uh, private uh, foundations, or private philanthropy, um, because every single one is different. 
and you know, to the issue of values and principles. Um, what are the values and principles driving the particular investor? Uh, I think sometimes a pattern that done, one does see is when you take um, money that has been accrued through a, a, you know, a method. Let's say um, great wealth has been accumulated through um, in investments. Um, you were talking about thinking about the, the invest, you know, having portfolios in, in that regard. That can be a, 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 an extremely brutal business in, 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 in the financial and corporate sector. Um, you know, that, uh, and, and they, the, the, the methods that are applied can then be just transferred over to another sector on the basis of, you know, this is, well, we're, we're using money as the mediator here. And I think to transfer that philosophy around money, that, you know, if you're making an investment, you want to make a profit. That's the bottom line. If you want to make a philanthropic investment, yes, you want to make, you want to make a social impact. And that, that, is, that is very different. It's a profit of sorts. But it needs to be managed in a very different way. And sometimes the culture actually doesn't change in, in the transfer. But I, I, I don't think that um, there is a common pattern. In, in my years of, of working with donors, I, I don't think you can segment um, in, in, that, in, in that way. Every single one is different. But to, to look at their values and principles and their method of working, I think one of the things that has been phenomenally useful is, is about building communities. Communities of, of like-minded people, uh, communities uh, of, of people that are working in particular ways, whether it be, you know, a camera membership, social entrepreneurs, because you can really enable each other. Because although NGOs are really, um, and we talked about this uh, a little earlier, but NGOs are examined to the nth degree, um, it, I don't feel it's the same in philanthropy. That they're, uh, they're not, the quality of philanthropy is not examined to the same degree. There are, you know, charity commission, etc., filing accounts, but not the quality of giving. So what is the quality of the money? And, and that is determined by the way that money is given and, and the relationship you develop as to its, its impact, its ultimate impact. And for donors to really understand that, that if you can develop a, a method and a system based on values and principles that, that both sides will honor, you are going to be able to create far more social impact. So it, I think, you know, it, it's some, um, I, I, I can't see patterns um, in, 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 the, in segmenting in, in, in that way at the moment. Interesting. Okay, over there for next, and then I, there's a whole bunch of questions which I'm going to try and mop up, okay? So get ready to be really snappy. We're going to do speed questions in a minute, but there are a couple still queued up. You, you, one of you guys, I can't remember which, and then we're going to do speed questions. Go. Hello, my name's Regina. I work as a, I'm an LSE alumni, and I work as a technology policy advisor for the Prime Minister's office. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of how do you manage traditional donors' expectations, desires, wants with the change in technology climate? And that mean, meaning that you know, the education for the students is gonna have to change and be more adaptable for the times. In accordance with that, how can government assist in that, whether that's writing policy, supporting regulation, or looking at new ways of impacting donors, whether that's virtual reality experiences of, of the kids in the schools, for example? Good question. Thank you. Sally, I'm going to ask you. Yeah, to um, that. Uh, almost all the folks we work with are using technology in some, in some, in some really innovative way. In, uh, as one example, um, uh, folks working with community health workers are equipping them with um, handheld devices so that they can actually keep their records, they can engage with, um, they can engage with uh, you know, pharmaceutical suppliers to understand what drugs are available and so on. So that it just, 
vastly increases their efficacy and um, unlocks their ability to cover far greater areas and numbers of people. So the social, social entrepreneurs are all adapting technologies and using them in, in very effective and empowering, um, in empowering ways. So, can, can I abuse my position in the chair just to say that I, I have an answer to your question, which is kind of Fiona's answer, which is that people should have a means by which it's clear that they own their own data. Mm -hmm. And data should itself start to be viewed as a philanthropic currency. Mm -hmm. It's a whole, it's a whole uh, other conversation, but it's an extremely important conversation. As, that, wi that as witness what Fiona said a second ago. That, sorry, sorry. that horse is out of the barn, Stefan. <laughs> Guess who owns the data? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, you know. But guess who produces the data? I know, but and guess who owns it and controls it and monetizes it and uses it? So this, I've been waiting for this moment all evening. We, we said earlier on that we, at least once we have to disagree. Okay. So I'm going to really disagree with this. It's true that one of the horses is out of one of the barns, but not all the horses are out of all the barns. It's perfectly possible to imagine a world in which we create a data commons into which producers, i.e. humans, of data can reclaim some of the uh, benefits of that data. Then you better get hold of the network providers and indeed, everybody indeed. else who's managing that because but, they've got it. But the question <laughs> came from government and of course there's this massive asymmetry as between the power of government and the power of, let's call it, well, like, should we get a name them? You know, any one of the companies that we all know their names of. But that's not a, that's not a lost battle. I knew we'd I'm not so something. sure. Right, question. Um, my name is Nishisa, I'm also an alumni. Um, it's actually a really good segue, I feel, into my question. So there's this theme um, from the conversation today around people and soft skills. My, I've made a transition out of the private sector after 10 years, culminating with two years at a tech company from Silicon Valley that will remain unnamed. Um, and I'm currently working for Nesta. So my, com my question is, how do we recognize the need for soft skills and build a society and corporate organizations that value the soft skills and integrity and authenticity? So essentially, how do we scale the DNA of a social entrepreneur such that it's not siloed within that world and we can actually scale it at a broader level? I'm going to ask you to address that. Sure. Uh, I, I was going to jump in actually and say, I think, we, especially in the Kama Network, are almost like the epitome of that. We have been um, from the receiving end of having been supported through school and then also now coming to a position where saying, what is it that we can be able to do? So there is a lot of, so I would pro tell you that on average, each and every Kama member is supporting three other children to be able to go to school that could be their siblings, it could be their own children or children that are not related to them. And um, I think as of last year alone, Kama was supporting over 362,000 children to go to school. And just because Comfort has been able to support just one, therefore Kama is now able to support even more through their own resources, either their running businesses or through their employment and how we're building that you know culture of we we believe that um because we've been supported comfort has paid forward to be able to support more so it's not necessarily of uh, a position of being uh, uh, the b word the beneficiary but it's an investment that has been done in an individual to not only benefit the individual but to benefit the family the community and the country at large so it's paying forward so I think within Kama, we're building that value of philanthropy among young people and we see ourselves as future donors to perhaps even comfort to be able to support more children as we progress in life. I have been a Kama member for more than 19 years now and there are Kama members who are doctors, who are teachers, who are business entrepreneurs and we are in the process of setting up what we call a Kama fund through which we can be able to make contributions that go beyond the immediate help we're giving in our communities to be able to support a wider group of young people for putting in the forefront, particularly the experts, which are the use end users of aid, is very, very important I think, to be able to 
continue cultivating philanthropy. So beyond the traditional uh, trust and foundation, but to be able to build it in within the communities themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're at that point now where we're going to have to speed things up because I would like everyone who wants to, to ask a question. So yours is the last solo question, after which, person two behind you, then we're going to chuck the microphone around and put them all together. So go with your question. Hi, my name's Rose. I'm in the International Inequalities Institute here in LSE, so I was interested in what you said about inequality and philanthropy. Um, I've been working in uh, community participatory philanthropy for the past five years or so and so it's really interesting to hear about the sort of shift that all of you guys have been talking about about community expertise and the asset-based approach in communities and recognizing that moving beyond this horrible beneficiary model and the other thing that I was thinking about and this my questions um, really for you Sally is um, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff recently in the philanthropic sector about moving beyond the idea that somehow entrepreneurs are going to create, social entrepreneurs are the be all and end all and these individuals are going to create change and which is a very sort of almost tech model, right? Uh, whereas actually we see that big social movements and, and communities tend to create change as opposed to individuals. So I was hoping that you might be able to talk about your approach uh, at Skoll between what, what's the benefit of supporting social entrepreneurs as individuals rather than an entrepreneurial approach that perhaps speaks a bit more to what the last speaker was talking about here. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a common misperception that we support individuals. We don't support individuals. We support organizations, and increasingly we're looking to those organizations to see who their strategic partners are, how they're engaged in communities, and how they're going about driving change. Um, the individual is often the face of the, of the organization. Maybe the founder, may not be the founder, maybe someone who came in, as Rupert did, to MSC and transforms the organization. But we find that that face and the story really gives, brings again that organization and its work alive. And so that's the, that's the um, bargain that we make at the at the Skoll Foundation and the humility and the um, capacity around these soft skills maybe we shouldn't call them soft skills because they are the skills of authentic leadership and that's what we look for authentic leadership that's about empowering others it's about respect it's about a profound sense of responsibility it's about a sustainable future it's about a long-term view um, these are the these are the attributes we look for in in leaders right we're at that point now where your questions have to be incredibly snappy otherwise i will cut you off and I'm going to ask as many of you as possible to get it in in under a minute, and then I'm going to try and make sense of the questions. So go. Um, my question is, um, normally we would view uh, recipients as being accountable to the donor, but I think all of you have touched upon the fact that actually you serve a certain community, and I was wondering to what extent do you feel like they hold you accountable, and if so, in, w in what ways do you notice that in your work, and do you try to uh, tap into that? Okay, next one. Very, very quickly, um, you said that philanthropy is ill-prepared or underprepared, Sally. I'd love to hear more of an elaboration on what you meant by that. Next one. Uh, I would be interested, because uh, you've all kind of touched upon differences in kind of misalignment or in values um, of a time perhaps where that works in practice. So if there's a time where that you entered into a relationship, either grantee or donor, and it didn't work out, and kind of the learnings that you took from that moving forward. Question. <laughs> yes. If money is the proxy for power, do you foresee a future where some of these foundations, Western foundations, are led by people who come from the marginalized communities at which they're benefiting? Question. That, I, as, unless, I'm, unless I'm ignoring anyone, that is our final set of questions. So we have four questions, okay? And um, you can volunteer to take them or I can allocate them. Um, the first um, is, um, what did we, m go on, go, go on, on then. <laughs> go on. I can't volunteer. read my writing. I'm volunteering. Um, <laughs> it's about the accountability. Yeah, mm. it's about recipients holding donors to account. You want to take that? It's about, it's also about communities holding NGOs and intermediaries account. Indeed. Oh. Yeah. Volunteering to take that? Yeah. Okay. Now? Yep. Yep. Um, We've got three more. Yep. That, um, I think that is, that is the ultimate. 
That is what you're looking for. Unless you design processes that hold you to account, unless, you know, in a, in a, a child's family knows, we are entitled to a school uniform, uh, your fir- you know, the first term it's supposed to arrive before the child starts school. People need to know what their entitlement is and need to know the system by which they challenge if it doesn't happen. And, you know, so the, the day uh, a rural grandmother who's never been over the threshold of a school comes in and says, my, my granddaughter's school skirt is too big for her. Hooray! You know, so, and that is a, you know, a, a, but, but a build that. Keep building, building, building that. So communities absolutely make demands because we serve, we do absolutely, and, and we have to believe it, not just say it as some kind of mantra, but, but act upon it. And those systems that enable that are really what make, you know, what create change. Indeed. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, if you think of it as an organization, say, for example, a school head teacher who is in work, says, I'll have my child on the comfort program. What are you going to do as an organization exactly. to ensure that you maintain the integrity? integrity. Yeah. Right. Next question, which is clearly yours, yes, yes. about the unpreparedness of philanthropy. And I will say that uh, philanthropy occupies this space between the public sector and the private sector. And if I look at institutionalized philanthropy in the US, that's the, those are the institutionalized organizations I know best. Um, they are uh, carrying out their philanthropy on 5% returns off their investments, and they are not leveraging the power that is in their endowment portfolio. That's a very clear <laughs> indication of how ill-prepared they are to drive change at scale. If you're discounting those assets, you know, the trillions of dollars that are in those assets, or close to a trillion dollars that's in that asset base, and you're just looking at the 5%, then that's madness. Um, because it's such a big question, I'm going to give, a, as it were, an abstract answer to the question of misalignment. I think that was your question. I would say that any relationship is misaligned when there is, um, when there is the, the kind of asymmetry that we've talked about, mm. and when one person lies to another about what they need or what they're doing or why they're doing it. And if you scale that up to the institutional level, you see it everywhere. You don't see it in the conversation that we've been having, but you see it everywhere. You see it in corporations, you see it in contracts, you see it in um, donations. Uh, And that's the place to go looking. Last question that we had from the floor, I'm gonna ask you to address, which is about the future leadership of big foundations. Did I get that right? Is that your question? Um, And uh, when will the world's biggest foundations be run by people on whose behalf those foundations claim to speak? Mm -hmm. So we are within our own organization beginning to see it happen. So for example, the national directors of Zimbabwe, the national director of Tanzania are KAMA members that are leading the implementation of comfort programs. And we're seeing also KAMA members taking up positions within governments in the districts where, so for example, if they were teachers, if they're working with the Minister of Health, they're now sitting on the boards that is deciding standards and policies and selection processes for comfort. So we're beginning to see that happen. And I foresee, I think in the very near future, perhaps maybe come our members being head of UNICEF and transforming the whole culture of perhaps how UNICEF provides support to children. So very soon is the answer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so I have only a couple more jobs. The first is hard, the second is easy. The first job is to try to draw a thread through the conversation. And I think what <coughs> has surprised me most is that you might expect a conversation about power dynamics in philanthropy, uh, about giving and receiving, to be about a bunch of rational things that are called stuff like impact or measurement or planning or discipline or rigor or strategy or all those things that we recognize from one kind of discourse. And yet, astonishingly in my view, the almost the entire tenor of our conversation has been about human relationships. It's been about collective responsibility and decision making. 
It's been about the creation of real relationships of trust and communities of trust. It's been about stories. It's been about the um, kind of uh, empathetic or soft skill capacity to uh, run, decide, and manage things. And almost nothing, in fact, I, I think nothing about our conversation has been remotely technocratic, even given the context in which we're having it, where you are all preoccupied with how you do things, how you plan things, how you measure them, how you, what kind of return it is. Uh, and indeed, I think Anne went so far as to say that some of the mechanisms by some of the analogies we use for looking at what return might look like might be mildly inappropriate or at least not simply transferable. So the thing I've learned is just how fantastically important the human element of this is. Somebody said, I can't remember who said it, that donors are humans too, uh, which really struck me. So, so that, that is my, is my uh, incomplete attempt to, to, to speak back a, a, a kind of flavor of, of what I think we've heard tonight. Um, and my last job is a much easier job, which is to thank you very much on our collective <coughs> behalf from the LSE, from the Marshall Institute, on your behalf, for doing something that I said at the beginning, and I continue to believe is, if not unique, then incredibly rare. You must understand how incredibly unusual it is for people to put themselves out in this way. This is a profoundly human take on a, on a big institutional thing that often presents as just about money. And I'm enormously grateful to you three for giving us your, your disclosure and your humanity and your honesty. So thank you very much. And last of all, thank you to you for mm. being here, for asking smart questions and for being part of what I persist in calling our movement. Thank you very much. Thank you.